Jonathan Harker's journal. 15th of October, Varna. We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris the same night and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Lord Godalming went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to this hotel, the Odysseus. The journey may have had incidents. I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God, Mina is well and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal. Throughout the journey she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert, and it has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotise her at such times. At first some effort was needed, and he had to make many passes, but now she seems to yield at once, as if by habit, and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power at these particular moments to simply will, and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, Nothing. All is dark. And to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. Canvas and cordage strain and masts and yards creak. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds and the bow throws back the foam. It is evident that the Tsarina Catherine is still at sea hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Godalming has just returned. He had four telegrams, one each day since we started, and all to the same effect, that the Tsarina Catherine had not been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agent should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message even if she were not reported, so that he might be sure that there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner, and went to bed early. Tomorrow we are to see the vice-consul, and to arrange, if we can, about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Helsing says that our chance will be to get on the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, can't cross the running water of his own volition, and so can't leave the ship. As he dare not change to man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid, he must remain in the box. If, then, we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy." for we can open the box and make sure of him as we did of poor Lucy before he wakes. What mercy he shall get from us will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with officials or the seamen. Thank God! This is the country where bribery can do anything, and we are well supplied with money. We have only to make sure that the ship can't come into port between sunset and sunrise without our being warned, and we shall be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16th of October. Mina's report, still the same. Lapping waves and rushing water, darkness and favouring winds. We are evidently in good time. And when we hear of the Tsarina Catherine, we shall be ready... As she must pass the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17th of October. Everything is pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Godalming told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent aboard might contain something stolen from a friend of his, and got a half-consent that he might open it at his own risk. 
The owner gave him a paper, telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose on board the ship, and also a similar authorization to his agent at Varna. We've seen the agent, who was much impressed with Godalming's kindly manner to him, and we're all satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We've already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count is there, Van Helsing and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. Morris and Godalming and I shall prevent interference, even if we have to use the arms which we shall have ready. The Professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon after fall into dust. In such case there would be no evidence against us, in case any suspicion of murder were aroused. But even if it were not, we should stand or fall by our act, and perhaps some day this very script may be evidence to come between some of us and a rope. For myself, I should take the chance only too thankfully if it were to come. We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent. We have arranged with certain officials that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we are to be informed by a special messenger. 24th of October. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story, not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried, lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking masts. Telegram, October the 24th. Rufus Smith, Lloyd's, London, to Lord Godalming, care of HBM Vice Consul Varna. Tsarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. Dr. Seward's Diary. 25th of October. How I miss my phonograph. To write diary with a pen is irksome to me. But Van Helsing says I must. We were all wild with excitement yesterday when Godalming got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now what men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. Mrs. Harker, alone of our party, did not show any signs of emotion. After all, it's not strange that she did not, for we took special care not to let her know anything about it, and we all tried not to show any excitement when we were in her presence. In old days she would, I'm sure, have noticed, no matter how we might have tried to conceal it, but in this way she is greatly changed during the past three weeks. The lethargy grows upon her, and though she seems strong and well and is getting back some of her colour, Van Helsing and I are not satisfied. We talk of her often. We have not, however, said a word to the others. It would break poor Harker's heart, certainly his nerve, if he knew that we had even a suspicion on the subject. Van Helsing examines, he tells me, her teeth very carefully, whilst she is in the hypnotic condition, for he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger of a change in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it be to contemplate, Euthanasia is an excellent and a comforting word. I am grateful to whoever invented it. It's only about twenty-four hours' sail from the Dardanelles to here, at the rate that Tsarina Catherine has come from London. She should therefore arrive some time in the morning. But as she can't possibly get in before then, we are all about to retire early. We shall get up at one o'clock, so as to be ready. Twenty-fifth of October, noon. 
No news yet of the ship's arrival. Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report this morning was the same as usual, so it's possible that we may get news at any moment. We men are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker, who is calm. His hands are cold as ice, and an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gurkha knife which he now always carries with him. It'll be a bad lookout for the Count if the edge of that cookery ever touches his throat, driven by that stern, ice-cold hand. Van Helsing and I were a little alarmed about Mrs. Harker today. About noon she got into a sort of lethargy which we did not like. Although we kept silence to the others, we were neither of us happy about it. She'd been restless all the morning, so that we were at first glad to know that she was sleeping. When, however, her husband mentioned casually that she was sleeping so soundly that he could not wake her, we went to her room to see for ourselves. She was breathing, naturally, and looked so well and peaceful that we agreed that the sleep was better for her than anything else. Poor girl, she has so much to forget that it is no wonder that sleep, if it brings oblivion to her, does her good. Later. Our opinion was justified, for when, after a refreshing sleep of some hours, she woke up, she seemed brighter and better than she had been for days. At sunset she made the usual hypnotic report. Wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his destination. To his doom, I trust. 26th of October Another day, and no tidings of the Tsarina Catherine. She ought to be here by now. That she is still journeying somewhere is apparent, for Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. It's possible that the vessel may be lying by at times for fog, some of the steamers which came in last evening reported patches of fog both to north and south of the port. We must continue our watching, as the ship may now be signalled at any moment. 27th of October Noon Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported last night and this morning, as usual, lapping waves and rushing water, though she added that the waves were very faint. The telegrams from London have been the same. No further report. Van Helsing is terribly anxious, and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. He added significantly, I did not like that lethargy of Madame Mina's. Souls and memories can do strange things during a trance. I was about to ask him more, but Harker just then came in, and he held up a warning hand. We must try tonight at sunset to make her speak more fully when in her hypnotic state. 28th of October Telegram Rufus Smith, London, to Lord Godalming, Care H.B.M., Vice-Consul, Varna. Tsarina Catherine reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's Diary 28th of October When the telegram came announcing the arrival in Galatz, I don't think it was such a shock to any of us as might have been expected. True, we didn't know whence or how or when the bolt would come, but I think we all expected that something strange would happen. The delay of arrival at Varna made us individually satisfied that things would not be just as we had expected. We only waited to learn where the change would occur. Nonetheless, however, it was a surprise. I suppose that nature works on such a hopeful basis that we believe against ourselves, 
that things will be as they ought to be, not as we should know that they will be. Transcendentalism is a beacon to the angels, even if it be a will-o'-the-wisp to man. It was an odd experience, and we all took it differently. Van Helsing raised his hand over his head for a moment as though in remonstrance with the Almighty, but he said not a word, and in a few seconds stood up with his face sternly set. Lord Godalming grew very pale and sat breathing heavily. I was myself half stunned and looked in wonder at one after another. Quincy Morris tightened his belt with that quick movement which I knew so well. In our old wandering days it meant action. Mrs. Harker grew ghastly white, so that the scar on her forehead seemed to burn, but she folded her hands meekly and looked up in prayer. Harker smiled, actually smiled, the dark, bitter smile of one who is without hope. But at the same time his action belied his words, for his hands instinctively sought the hilt of the great cookery knife and rested there. "'When does the next train start for Galatz?' said Van Helsing to us generally. At six-thirty tomorrow morning, we all started, for the answer came from Mrs. Harker. "'How on earth do you know?' said Art. "'You forget, or perhaps you don't know, though Jonathan does, and so does Dr. Van Helsing, that I'm a train fiend. At home in Exeter, I always used to make up the timetables so as to be helpful to my husband.' I found it so useful sometimes that I always make a study of the timetables now. I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, we should go by Galatz, or at any rate through Bucharest. So I learned the times very carefully. Unhappily there are not many to learn, as the only train tomorrow leaves, as I say. Wonderful woman, murmured the professor. Can't we get a special? asked Lord Godalming. Van Helsing shook his head. I fear not. This land is very different from yours, or mine. Even if we did have a special, it would probably not arrive as soon as our regular train. Moreover, we have something to prepare. We must think. Now, let us organize. You, friend Arthur, Go to the train and get the tickets and arrange that all be ready for us to go in the morning. Do you, friend Jonathan, go to the agent of the ship and get from him letters to the agent in Galatz with authority to make search the ship just as it was here. Maurice Quincy, you see the vice consul and get his aid with this fellow in Galatz and all he can do to make our way smooth so that no times be lost when over the Danube. John will stay with Madame Mina and me and we shall consult. For so, if time be long, you may be delayed, and it will not matter when the sun sets, since I am here with Madame to make report. And I, said Mrs. Harker, brightly and more like her old self than she had been for many a long day, shall try to be of use in all ways, and shall think and write for you as I used to do. Something is shifting from me in some strange way, and I feel freer than I have been of late. The three younger men looked happier at the moment as they seemed to realize the significance of her words. But Van Helsing and I, turning to each other, met each a grave and troubled glance. We said nothing at the time, however. When the three men had gone out to their tasks, Van Helsing asked Mrs. Harker to look up the copy of the diaries and find him the part of Harker's journal at the castle. She went away to get it. When the door was shut upon her, he said to me, We mean the same. Speak out. There is some change. It is a hope that makes me sick, for it may deceive us. Quite so. Do you know why I asked her to get the manuscript? No, 
said I, unless it was to get an opportunity of seeing me alone. You are in part right, friend John, but only in part. I want to tell you something. And, oh, my friend, I am taking a great, a terrible risk, but I believe it is right. In the moment when Madame Mina said those words that arrest both our understanding, an inspiration come to me. In the trance of three days ago, the Count sent her his spirit to read her mind, or more like he took her to see him in his earth box in the ship with water rushing just as it go free at rise and set of sun. He learned then that we are here, for she have more to tell in her open life with eyes to see and ears to hear than he, shut as he is in his coffin box. Now, he make his most effort to escape us. At present, he want her not. He is sure with his so great knowledge that she will come at his call. But he cut her off, take her as he can do out of his own power, that so she come not to him. Ah, there I have hope that our man-brains that have been of man so long and that have not lost the grace of God will come higher than his child brain that lie in his tomb for centuries, that grow not yet to our stature, and that do only work selfish and therefore small. Here comes Madame Mina, not a word to her of her trance. She know it not, and it would overwhelm her and make despair just when we want all her hope, all her courage, when most we want all her great brain, which is trained like man's brain, but is of sweet woman, and have a special power which the Count give her, and which he may not take away altogether, though he think not so. Shh, let me speak, and you shall learn. Oh, John, my friend, we are in awful straits. I fear, as I never feared before. We can only trust the good God. Silence, here she comes. I thought that the professor was going to break down and have hysterics, just as he had when Lucy died. But, with a great effort, he controlled himself, and was at perfect nervous poise when Mrs. Harker tripped into the room, bright and happy-looking, and in the doing of work, seemingly forgetful of her misery. As she came in, she handed a number of sheets of typewriting to Van Helsing. He looked over them gravely, his face brightening up as he read. Then, holding the pages between his finger and thumb, he said, Friend John, to you, with so much of experience already, and you too, dear Madame Mina, that are young, here is a lesson. Do not fear ever to think. A half-thought has been buzzing often in my brain, but I fear to let him loose his wings. Here now, with more knowledge, I go back to where that half-thought come from, and I find that he be no half-thought at all. That be a whole thought, though so young that he is not yet strong to use his little wings. Nay, like the ugly duck of my friend Hans Andersen, he be no duck thought at all, but a big swan thought that sail nobly on big wings when the time come for him to try them. <laughs> See, I read here what Jonathan have written. That other of his race who in a later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who when he was beaten back came again and again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. What does this tell us? Not much, no. The Count's child thought see nothing, therefore he speaks so free. Your man thought see nothing, my man thought see nothing, till just now. No, but there comes another word from someone who speak without thought, because she too know not what it mean, what it might mean. Just as there are elements which rest, yet when in nature's course they move on their way and they touch, then poof, there comes a flash of light heaven-wide that blind and kill and destroy some. But that show up all earth below for leagues and leagues. Is it not so? Well, I shall explain. To begin, have you ever studied the philosophy of crime? Yes and no. 
You, John, yes, for it is a study of insanity. You, no, Madam Mina, for crime touch you not, not but once. Still, your mind works true and argues not a particulari ad universali. There is peculiarity in criminals. It is so constant in all countries and at all times that even police, who know not much from philosophy, come to know it empirically that it is. That is to be empiric. The criminal always work at one crime. That is the true criminal who seems predestinate to crime and who will of none other. This criminal has not full man brain. He is clever and cunning and resourceful, but he be not of man stature as to brain. He be of child brain and much. Now this criminal of ours is predestinate to crime also. He too have child brain. And it is of the child to do what he have done. The little bird, the little fish, the little animal, learn not by principle, but empirically. And when he learn to do, then there is to him the ground to start from to do more. Dos pusto, said Archimedes. Give me a fulcrum, and I shall move the world. To do once is the fulcrum whereby child brain become man brain. And until he have the purpose to do more, he continue to do the same again every time, just as he have done before. Oh, my dear, I see that your eyes are opened, and that to you the lightning flash show all the leagues. For Mrs. Harker began to clap her hands, and her eyes sparkled. He went on. Now, you shall speak. Tell us two dry men of science what you see with those so bright eyes. He took her hand and held it whilst she spoke. His finger and thumb closed on her pulse, as I thought instinctively and unconsciously, as she spoke. The Count is a criminal, and of criminal type. Nordau and Lombroso would so classify him, and qua criminal he is of imperfectly formed mind. Thus, in a difficulty, he has to seek resource in habit. His past is a clue, and the one page of it that we know, and that from his own lips, tells that once before, when in what Mr. Morris would call a tight place, he went back to his own country from the land he had tried to invade, and thence, without losing purpose, prepared himself for a new effort. He came again better equipped for his work, and won. So he came to London to invade a new land. He was beaten, and when all hope of success was lost and his existence in danger, he fled back over the sea to his home, just as formerly he had fled back over the Danube from Turkeyland. Good, good, oh, you so clever lady, said Van Helsing enthusiastically, as he stooped and kissed her hand. A moment later he said to me as calmly as though we had been having a sick room consultation, seventy-two only, and in all this excitement I have hope. Turning to her again, he said with keen expectation, But go on, go on. There is more to tell, if you will. Be not afraid, John, and I know. I do in any case, and shall tell you if you are right. Speak without fear. I will try to, but you will forgive me if I seem egotistical. No, if you are not, you must be egotist, for it is of you that we think. Then, as he is criminal, he is selfish. And as his intellect is small and his action is based on selfishness, he confines himself to one purpose. That purpose is remorseless. As he fled back over the Danube, leaving his forces to be cut to pieces, so now he is intent on being safe, careless of all. So his own selfishness frees my soul somewhat from the terrible power which he acquired over me on that dreadful night. I felt it. Oh, I felt it. Thank God for his great mercy. My soul is freer than it has been since that awful hour, and all that haunts me is a fear lest in some trance or dream he may have used my knowledge for his ends. The professor stood up. He has so used your mind, and by it he has left us here in Varner 
whilst the ship that carried him rushed through enveloping fog up to Galatz, where doubtless he had made preparation for escaping from us. But his child mine only saw so far, and it may be that, as ever is in God's providence, the very thing that the evildoer most reckoned on for his selfish good turns out to be his chiefest harm. The hunter is taken in his own snare, as the great psalmist says. For now that he think he is free from every trace of us all, and that he has escaped us with so many hours to him, then his selfish child brain will whisper him to sleep. He think, too, that as he cut himself off from knowing your mind, there can be no knowledge of him to you. There is where he fail. That terrible baptism of blood which he give you makes you free to go to him in spirit, as you have as yet done in your times of freedom when the sun rise and set. At such times you go by my volition and not by his, and this power to good of you and others you have won from your suffering at his hands. This is now all more precious that he know it not, and to guard himself have even cut himself off from his knowledge of our where. We, however, are not selfish, and we believe that God is with us through all this blackness and these many dark hours. We shall follow him, and we shall not flinch, even if we peril ourselves that we become like him. Friend John, this has been a great hour, and it have done much to advance us on our way. You must be scribe and write him all down, so that when the others return from their work, you can give it to them, and then they shall know as we do. And so I have written it whilst we wait their return, and Mrs. Harker has written with her typewriter all since she brought the MS to us. Chapter 26 Dr. Seward's Diary 29th of October This is written in the train from Varna to Galatz. Last night we all assembled a little before the time of sunset. Each of us had done his work as well as he could. So far as thought and endeavour and opportunity go, we are prepared for the whole of our journey and for our work when we get to Galatz. When the usual time came round, Mrs. Harker prepared herself for her hypnotic effort, and after a longer and more serious effort on the part of Van Helsing than has been usually necessary, she sank into the trance. Usually she speaks on a hint, but this time the professor had to ask her questions, and to ask them pretty resolutely, before we could learn anything. At last her answer came. I can see nothing. We are still. There are no waves lapping, but only a steady swirl of water softly running against the hawser. I can hear men's voices calling, near and far, and the roll and creak of oars in the rollocks. A gun is fired somewhere. The echo of it seems far away. There is a tramping of feet overhead, and ropes and chains are dragged along. What's this? There's a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me. Here she stopped. She had risen as if impulsively from where she lay on the sofa, and raised both her hands, palms upwards, as if lifting a weight. Van Helsing and I looked at each other with understanding. Quincy raised his eyebrows slightly and looked at her intently, whilst Harker's hand instinctively closed round the hilt of his cookery. There was a long pause. We all knew that the time when she could speak was passing, but we felt that it was useless to say anything. Suddenly she sat up, and, as she opened her eyes, said sweetly, "'Would none of you like a cup of tea? You must all be so tired.' We could only make her happy, and so acquiesced. She bustled off to get tea. When she'd gone, Van Helsing said, You see, my friends, he is close to land. He has left his earth chest, but he has yet to get on shore. 
in the night he may lie hidden somewhere. But if he be not carried on shore, or if the ship do not touch it, he cannot achieve the land. In such case he can, if it be in the night, change his form, and can jump or fly on shore, as he did at Whitby. But if the day come before he get on shore, then, unless he be carried, he cannot escape. And if he be carried, then the customs men may discover what the box contained. Thus, in fine, if he escape not on shore tonight, or before dawn, there will be the whole day lost to him. We may then arrive in time, for if he escape not at night, we shall come on him in daytime, boxed up and at our mercy. For he dare not be his true self, awake and visible, lest he be discovered. There was no more to be said. So we waited in patience until the dawn, at which time we might learn more from Mrs. Harker. Early this morning we listened with breathless anxiety for her response in her trance. The hypnotic stage was even longer in coming than before, and when it came the time remaining until full sunrise was so short that we began to despair. Van Helsing seemed to throw his whole soul into the effort. At last, in obedience to his will, she made reply, All is dark. I hear lapping water level with me, and some creaking as of wood on wood. She paused, and the red sun shot up. We must wait till tonight. And so it is that we're travelling towards Galatz in an agony of expectation. We're due to arrive between two and three in the morning, but already at Bucharest we are three hours late, so we can't possibly get in till well after sun-up. Thus we shall have two more hypnotic messages from Mrs. Harker. Either or both may possibly throw more light on what is happening. Later. Sunset has come and gone. Fortunately it came at a time when there was no distraction, for had it occurred whilst we were at a station, we might not have secured the necessary calm and isolation. Mrs. Harker yielded to the hypnotic influence even less readily than this morning. I am in fear that her power of reading the Count's sensations may die away just when we want it most. It seems to me that her imagination is beginning to work. Whilst she has been in the trance hitherto, she has confined herself to the simplest of facts— if this goes on, it may ultimately mislead us. If I thought that the Count's power over her would die away equally with her power of knowledge, it would be a happy thought. But I am afraid that it may not be so. When she did speak, her words were enigmatical. Something is going out. I can feel it pass me like a cold wind. I can hear far off confused sounds as of men talking in strange tongues, fierce falling water, and the howling of wolves. She stopped, and a shudder ran through her, increasing in intensity for a few seconds, till at the end she shook as though in a palsy. She said no more, even in answer to the professor's imperative questioning. When she woke from the trance, she was cold and exhausted and languid but her mind was all alert. She couldn't remember anything but asked what she had said. When she was told, she pondered over it deeply for a long time, and in silence. Thirtieth of October, 7 a.m. We're near Galatz now, and I may not have time to write later, Sunrise this morning was anxiously looked for by us all. Knowing of the increasing difficulty of procuring the hypnotic trance, Van Helsing began his passes earlier than usual. They produced no effect, however, until the regular time, when she yielded with a still greater difficulty, only a minute before the sun rose. The professor lost no time in his questioning. Her answer came with equal quickness. All is dark. I hear water swirling by, level with my ears. 
and the creaking of wood on wood. Cattle low far off. There is another sound, a queer one, like... She stopped, and grew white, and whiter still. Go on, go on, speak, I command you, said Van Helsing, in an agonized voice. At the same time there was despair in his eyes, for the risen sun was reddening even Mrs. Harker's pale face. She opened her eyes, and we all started, as she said sweetly and seemingly with the utmost concern, Oh, Professor, why ask me to do what you know I can't? I don't remember anything. Then, seeing the look of amazement on her faces, she said, turning from one to the other with a troubled look, What have I said? What have I done? I know nothing, only that I was lying here, half asleep, and heard you say, Go on, speak, I command you. It seemed so funny to hear you order me about as if I were a bad child. Oh, Madam Mina, he said sadly, it is proof, if proof be needed, of how I love and honour you, when a word for your good, spoken more earnest than ever, can seem so strange because it is to order her whom I am proud to obey. The whistles are sounding. We are nearing Galatz. We are on fire with anxiety and eagerness. Mina Harker's Journal 30th of October Mr. Morris took me to the hotel, where our rooms had been ordered by telegraph, he being the one who could best be spared, since he does not speak any foreign language. The forces were distributed much as they had been at Varna, except that Lord Godalming went to the Vice-Council, as his rank might serve as an immediate guarantee of some sort to the official, we being in extreme hurry. Jonathan and the two doctors went to the shipping agent to learn particulars of the arrival of the Tsarina Catherine. Later. Lord Godalming has returned. The consul is away, and the vice-consul sick, so the routine work has been attended to by a clerk. He was very obliging, and offered to do anything in his power. Jonathan Harker's Journal 30th of October At nine o'clock, Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward, and I called on Messrs. Mackenzie and Steinkoff, the agents of the London firm of Hapgood. They had received a wire from London in answer to Lord Godalming's telegraphed request, asking them to show us any civility in their power. They were more than kind and courteous, and took us at once on board the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor out in the river harbour. There we saw the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage. He said that in all his life he had never had so favourable a run. Man, he said, but it made us afeard, for we expect it that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of ill luck, so as to keep up the average. It's no canny to run for London to the Black Sea, where a wind ahind ye as though the devil himself were blowing on your sail for his own purpose. And all the time we could not spear a thing. Gin we were nigh a ship, or a port, or a headland, a fog fell on us and trouble with us. Till when after it had lifted and we looked out, the devil a thing could we see. We ran by Gibraltar without being able to signal. "'until we came to the Dardanelles "'and had to wait to get our permit to pass. "'We never were within hail or aught. Well, "'At first I inclined to slack off sail "'and beat about till the fog was lifted. "'But whilst I thought that if the Dell was minded "'to get us into the Black Sea quick, "'he was like to do it whether we would or no. "'If we had a quick voyage, "'it would be no to our miscredit with the owners "'or no hurt to our traffic.' and the old man who had served his own purpose was be decently grateful to us for no hindering him. This mixture of simplicity and cunning, of superstition and commercial reasoning, aroused Van Helsing, who said, "'Mine friend, that devil is more clever than he is thought by some, and he know when he meet his match.' 
the skipper was not displeased with the compliment, and went on, When we got past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble. Some of them, the Romanians, came and asked me to heave overboard a big box which had been put on board by a queer-looking old man just before we'd started for London. I'd seen them spear at the fellow and put on their twa fingers when they saw him to guard against the evil eye. Man, but the superstition of foreigners is perfectly ridiculous. I sent them about their business pretty quick, but as just after a fog closed in on us, I felt a wee bit as they did and then something, though I wouldn't say it was again the big box. Well, on we went, and as the fog didn't let up for five days, why just let the wind carry us? For if the Dale wanted to get somewheres, well, he'd fetch it up a reed. And if he didn't, well, we'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure enough, we had a fair way and deep water all the time, and two days ago, when the morning sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just in the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild, and wanted me, right or wrong, to take out the box and fling it in the river. I had to argue with them about it with a handspike, and when the last of them rose off the deck with his head in his hand... I'd convinced them that evil eye or no evil eye, the property and the trust of my owners were better in my hands than in the river Danube. They had, mind ye, taken the box on the deck ready to fling in, and as it was marked Galatch via Varner, I thought I'd let it lie till we discharged in the port and get rid of it altogether. We didn't do much clearing that day, and had to remain the nick that anchor. But in the morning, braw and early, an hour before sun-up, a man came aboard with an order, written to him from England to receive her box macked for one Count Dracula. Sure enough, the matter was one ready to his hand. He had his papers all right, and glad there was to be rid of the damn thing, for I was beginning myself to feel uneasy about it. If the devil did have any luggage aboard the ship, I'm thinking it was none other than that same. What was the name of the man who took it? asked Dr. Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. "'I'll be telling you quick,' he answered, and stepping down to his cabin produced a receipt signed, "'Emmanuel Hildesheim. Bergenstrasse 16 was the address. "'We found out that this was all the captain knew, so with thanks we came away. "'We found Hildesheim in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adelphi theatre type, "'with a nose like a sheep and a fez. "'His arguments were pointed with specie, we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargaining, he told us what he knew. This turned out to be simple but important. He had received a letter from Mr. Deville of London, telling him to receive, if possible, before sunrise, so as to avoid customs, a box which would arrive at Galatz in the Tsarina Katerine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks who traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for his work by an English banknote which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Skinsky had come to him, he had taken him to the ship and handed over the box so as to save porterage. That was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbours, who didn't seem to bear him any affection, said that he'd gone away two days before, no one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house, together with the rent due, in English money. This had been between ten and eleven o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. Those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror, the women crying out, This is the work of a Slovak. We hurried away, lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair, and so detained. As we came home, we could arrive at no definite conclusion. We were all convinced that the box was on its way by water to somewhere, but where that might be, we would have to discover. With heavy hearts, we came home to the hotel to Mina.
When we met together, the first thing was to consult as to taking Mina again into our confidence. Things are getting desperate, and it is at least a chance, though a hazardous one. As a preliminary step, I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal 30th of October, evening. They were so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they had had some rest. So I asked them all to lie down for half an hour, whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the traveller's typewriter, and to Mr. Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray doing the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done. Poor dear, dear Jonathan! What he must have suffered! What must he be suffering now? He lies on the sofa, hardly seeming to breathe, and his whole body appears in collapse. His brows are knit, his face is drawn with pain. Poor fellow! Maybe he is thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh, if I could only help at all! I shall do what I can. I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over all carefully, and perhaps I may arrive at some conclusion. I shall try to follow the professor's example, and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that under God's providence I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get our party together and read it. They can judge it. It is well to be accurate, and every minute is precious. Mina Harker's Memorandum Entered in her journal. Ground of inquiry. Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. A. He must be brought back by someone. This is evident, for had he power to move himself as he wished, he could go either as man or wolf or bat or in some other way. He evidently fears discovery or interference in the state of helplessness in which he must be, confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box. B. How is he to be taken? Here a process of exclusions may help us. By road? By rail? By water? 1. By road. There are Endless difficulties, especially in leaving the city. X. There are people. And people are curious and investigate. A hint, a surmise, a doubt as to what might be in the box would destroy him. Why? There are, or there may be, customs and octroi officers to pass. C. His pursuers might follow. This is his highest fear, and in order to prevent his being betrayed, he has repelled, so far as he can, even his victim, me. 2. By rail. There is no one in charge of the box. It would have to take its chance of being delayed, and delay would be fatal with enemies on the track. True, he might escape at night, but what would he be if left in a strange place with no refuge that he could fly to? This is not what he intends, and he does not mean to risk it. 3. By water Here is the safest way, in one respect, but with most danger in another. On the water... 
he is powerless, except at night. Even then he can only summon fog and storm and snow and his wolves. But were he wrecked, the living water would engulf him, helpless, and he would indeed be lost. He could have the vessel drive to land, but if it were unfriendly land, wherein he was not free to move, his position would still be desperate. We know from the record that he was on the water. What we have to do is to ascertain what water. The first thing is to realize exactly what he has done as yet. We may then get a light on what his later task is to be. Firstly, we must differentiate between what he did in London as part of his general plan of action, when he was pressed for moments and had to arrange as best he could. Secondly, we must see, as well as we can surmise it from the facts we know of, what he has done here. As to the first, he evidently intended to arrive at Gollitz, and sent envoys to Varna to deceive us, lest we should ascertain his means of exit from England. His immediate and sole purpose, then, was to escape. The proof of this is the letter of instruction sent to Emmanuel Hildesheim to clear and take away the box before sunrise. There is also the instruction to Petrov Skinsky. These we must only guess at, but there must have been some letter or message since Skinsky came to Hildesheim. That so far his plans were successful, we know. The Tsarina Catherine made a phenomenally quick journey, so much so that Captain Donaldson's suspicions were aroused. But his superstition, united with his canniness, played the Count's game for him, and he ran with his favouring wind through fogs and all, till he brought up blindfold at Galatz. That the Count's arrangements were well made has been proved. Hildesheim cleared the box, took it off, and gave it to Skinsky. Skinsky took it, and here we lose the trail. We only know that the box is somewhere on the water, moving along. The customs and the octroi, if there be any, have been avoided. Now we come to what the Count must have done after his arrival, on land, at Galatz. The box was given to Skinsky before sunrise. At sunrise the Count could appear in his own form. Here we ask why Skinsky was chosen at all to aid in the work. In my husband's diary, Skinsky is mentioned as dealing with the Slovaks who trade down the river to the port, and the man's remark that the murder was the work of a Slovak showed the general feeling against his class. The Count wanted isolation. My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. He was brought from the castle by Sagani, and probably they delivered their cargo to Slovaks, who took the boxes to Varna, for there they were shipped for London. Thus the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange this service. When the box was on land, before sunrise or after sunset, he came out from his box, met Skinsky, and instructed him what to do as to arranging the carriage of the box up some river. When this was done, and he knew that all was in train, he blotted out his traces, as he thought, by murdering his agent. I have examined the map, and find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to have ascended is either the Pruth or the Sereth. I read in the typescript that in my trance I heard cows low, and water swirling level with my ears, and the creaking of wood. The Count in his box, then, was on a river 
in an open boat, propelled probably either by oars or poles, for the banks are near, and it is working against stream. There would be no such sound if floating downstream. Of course, it may not be either the Sereth or the Pruth, but we may possibly investigate further. Now, of these two, the Pruth is the more easily navigated, but the Sereth is at Fondue, joined by the Bastritza, which runs up round the Borgo Pass. The loop it makes is manifestly as close to Dracula's castle as one can be got by water. Mina Harker's Journal Continued When I had done reading, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, Our dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher. Her eyes have been where we were blinded. Now we are on the track once again, and this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless, and if we can come on him by day, on the water, our task will be over. He has a start, but he is powerless to hasten, as he may not leave his box, lest those who carry him may suspect. For them to suspect would be to prompt them to throw him in the stream where he perish. This he knows, and will not. Now, men, to our council of war, for here and now we must plan what each and all shall do. I shall get a steam launch and follow him, said Lord Godalming, and I horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. Good, said the professor, both good. But neither must go alone. There must be force to overcome force if need be. The Slovak is strong and rough, and he carries rude arms. All the men smiled, for amongst them they carried a small arsenal. Said Mr. Morris, I have brought some Winchesters. They are pretty handy in a crowd, and there may be wolves. The Count, if you remember, took some precautions. He made some requisitions on others that Mrs. Harker could not quite hear or understand. We must be ready at all points. Dr. Seward said, I think I had better go with Quincy. We have been accustomed to hunt together, and we two, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. You must not be alone, Art. It may be necessary to fight the Slovaks, and a chance thrust, for I don't suppose these fellows carry guns, would undo all our plans. There must be no chances this time. We shall not rest until the Count's head and body have been separated, and we are sure that he cannot reincarnate. He looked at Jonathan as he spoke, and Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor dear was torn about in his mind. Of course he wanted to be with me, but then the boat service would most likely be the one which would destroy the... the... the vampire. Why did I hesitate to write the word? He was silent a while, and during his silence, Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friend Jonathan, this is to you for twice reasons. First, because you are young and brave, and can fight, and all energy may be needed at the last. And again, that it is your right to destroy him, that which has wrought such woe to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madam Mina. She will be my care, if I may. I am old. My legs are not so quick to run as once, and I am not used to ride so long or to pursue as need be, or to fight with lethal weapons. But I can be of other service. I can fight in other way, and I can die if need be as well as younger men. Now let me say that what I would is this. While you, my lord Gardalming, and friend Jonathan, go in your so swift little steamboat up the river, 
and whilst John and Quincy guard the bank where perchance he might be landed, I will take Madame Mina right into the heart of the enemy's country, whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream whence he cannot escape to land, where he dares not raise the lid of his coffin-box, lest his Slovak carers should in fear leave him to perish, we shall go in the track where Jonathan went, from B streets over the Borgo, and find our way to the castle of Dracula. Here, Madame Mina's hypnotic power will surely help, and we shall find our way, all dark and unknown otherwise, after the first sunrise, when we are near that fateful place. There is much to be done, and other places to be made sanctify, so that nest of vipers be obliterated. Here Jonathan interrupted him hotly. Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case and tainted as she is, with that devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death-trap? Not for the world, not for heaven or hell. He became almost speechless for a minute, and then went on. Do you know what the place is? Have you seen that awful den of hellish infamy? With the very moonlight alive with grisly shapes, and every speck of dust that whirls in the wind, a devouring monster and embryo? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? Here he turned to me, and as his eyes lit on my forehead, he threw up his arms with a cry. Oh, my God! What have we done to have this terror upon us? And he sank down on the sofa in a collapse of misery, the professor's voice, as he spoke in clear, sweet tones, which seemed to vibrate in the air, calmed us all. Oh, my friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina from that awful place that I would go. God forbid that I should take her into that place. There's work, wild work, to be done there, that her eyes may not see. We men here, all save Jonathan, have seen with their own eyes what is to be done before that place can be purified. Remember that we are in terrible straits. If the Count escape us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to steep him for a century. And then in time, our dear one, he took my hand, would come to him to keep him company, and would be as those others that you, Jonathan, saw. You have told us of their gloating lips. You heard their ribald laugh as they clutched the moving bag that the Count threw to them. You shudder, and well may it be. Forgive me that I make you so much pain, but it is necessary. My friend... Is it not a dire need for the which I am giving possibly my life? If it were that any one went into that place to stay, it is I who have to go to keep them company. Do as you will, said Jonathan, with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God. Later. Oh... It did me good to see the way that these brave men worked. How can women help loving men when they are so earnest and so true and so brave? And, too, it made me think of the wonderful power of money. What can it not do when it is properly applied? And what might it do when basely used? I felt so thankful that Lord Godalming is rich, and that both he and Mr. Morris, who also has plenty of money, are willing to spend it so freely. For if they did not, our little expedition could not start, either so promptly or so well equipped, as it will within another hour. 
it is not three hours since it was arranged what part each of us was to do. And now Lord Godalming and Jonathan have a lovely steam launch, with steam up, ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris have half a dozen good horses, well appointed. We have all the maps and appliances of various kinds that can be had. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave by the 11.40 train tonight for Bereste, where we are to get a carriage to drive to the Borgo Pass. We are bringing a good deal of ready money, as we are to buy a carriage and horses. We shall drive ourselves, for we have no one whom we can trust in the matter. The professor knows something of a great many languages, so we shall get on all right. We have all got arms, even for me a large bore revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest. Alas, I cannot carry one arm that the rest do. The scar on my forehead forbids that. Dear Dr. Van Helsing comforts me by telling me that I am fully armed, as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour, and there are snow flurries which come and go as warnings. Later. It took all my courage to say good-bye to my darling. We may never meet again. Courage, Mina. The professor is looking at you keenly. His look is a warning. There must be no tears now, unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness.' 